Hello and welcome to the real review of the Warmind expansion for Destiny 2. Now what exactly do I mean when I say real review? Well, it's quite simple actually. I have played and completed all of the new content available in Warmind, something that a shockingly high amount of other reviews cannot claim. Every other review I've seen involves the reviewer saying, well, I wasn't high enough level to do X activity. So in this review, you're going to get a perspective not of someone who's heard of an activity, but of someone who's actually done it. And I feel like that's extremely valuable to someone deciding whether or not they want to purchase this piece of content. So without further ado, let's get started. <laughs> What is up guys, Rick Kakis here, and this is the complete review of the Warmind expansion for Destiny 2. Now I know I'm definitely late to the party, but again, that's kind of the point. I wanted to actually experience this expansion before giving my thoughts. So I really appreciate all of you guys who have slogged through the other reviews and Fortnite clickbait to find this video, and especially thanks to those of you who share it with a friend and so on who are considering to buy this expansion. So. Let's get started here at the top with the campaign available with Warmind. But a little bit of a disclaimer. I don't feel like you should be putting too much of an emphasis on the campaign. Now that's not to say that I'm going to let Bungie off the hook for having a potentially bad campaign or anything like that, but that's to say that if you are someone who wants a narrative-driven game, there are other options, better options out there. The Witcher 3, the new God of War game, fantastic narrative-driven games. Destiny has never really had that. Even at its high with The Taken King, it was really not that amazing of a campaign. Like, it really wasn't anything groundbreaking. Destiny is more about your personal quest, leveling up, getting new gear, facing more increasing difficult challenges. That is what Destiny is all about, not necessarily sculpting a narrative. With that being said, a good campaign certainly is a good feature of an expansion and it puts you in the right mindset and gives you the right perspective for all of the other activities within this DLC. So did Bungie achieve that? Well, frankly, if I was to sum up the campaign in a single word, it would be disappointing. Now, with me saying that, you actually have to have expectations to be disappointed, right? If you go into something with zero expectations and the whole time you have zero expectations, you're never gonna be disappointed because you never expected anything. The saddest thing about this campaign is it has legitimately cool and interesting moments, including interesting boss fights, interesting mechanics, and interesting encounters. So there are portions of the campaign within Warmind that legitimately suck you in, that legitimately get you interested and even invested in the storyline. But just as soon as that happens, you're disappointed because frankly the campaign as a whole can be beaten in around two hours, probably less if you're trying to beat it fast. You could extend this playtime a little bit by getting distracted, doing other activities and then coming back to the campaign, but it's just around two hours. That is incredibly short. Now it's not short and sweet even, it's just short. As soon as things start to get really cool, the campaign really abruptly ends. There's a moment where you start to hear Rasputin speak for the first time and it is epic. Now, I am planning to show this here, so spoiler alert, skip ahead about one minute if you want to avoid this, but here it is. In terms. I am Rasputin, guardian of all I serve it. I have no equal. What have we done? I legitimately think that part of the campaign was amazing. I was totally sucked in. I was telling my party members to shut up because I wanted to listen to what was going on. But as soon as that happens, like exactly as that happens, the campaign ends. It's over. There's nothing after that. So just as things start to get cool, just as you unchain this incredibly powerful and mysterious artificial intelligence, the campaign ends. There's no follow-up. And the most disappointing part is that this is exactly what happened with the previous expansion with Curse of Osiris. 
in Rasputin's place, you had Osiris, this mysterious and almost equally powerful warlock that finally, when you met him at the end of the campaign and started talking to him, you had this awkward conversation and he was gone. That was it. It was incredibly unfulfilling and it's just as unfulfilling the second time around with Rasputin in Osiris's place. It's really, really mind-boggling that Bungie would make the exact same mistake twice. It really just is. So, the campaign, again, has legitimately cool and fun moments, but those moments ultimately lead to disappointment. Bungie really has to step up their storytelling. But again, far too many people are putting too much of an emphasis on this campaign. Destiny is not a narrative-driven game. It's an RPG. So how are the RPG elements? Well, let's talk about that next. Firstly, let's talk about a baseline factor within this expansion, which is the change to how you level up. Now, this is big because going from Curse of Osiris, if that's the last time you played, coming back with Warmind, you are going to level up unbelievably slower. But essentially, everything is going to be normal until you hit a soft cap of 340 power level. 345 if you have gear with mods on it that give you an extra five power levels. At this point, everything is going to stop at the soft cap except for your milestone activities. So the only ways to level up once you hit 345 essentially is to do the milestone for doing three heroic strikes, is to do Trials of Osiris and the Raid, is to do your Crucible Call to Arms milestone, and is to level up your clan engrams. Also, you have your Flashpoint and the Nightfall, and if you somehow manage to beat Wave 7 of Escalation Protocol, the End Chest will give you one piece of high power level gear. So, overall again, leveling is slower, which as a whole, this is not the worst thing. Just jettisoning through all of the power levels and reaching the max power level in just a couple of days, which was the case with, frankly, original Destiny and the case with Curse of Osiris, means that you're left with a what next moment a lot sooner. And that what next moment, the answer is pretty much always disappointing when it comes to Destiny 2. The end game has had several problems with it. Warminded tries to address that, but still, overall, leveling slower is not the worst thing. However, Bungie tried to do this so aggressively that it has created several problems. Number one, once you have done all of your milestones, or once you have done the things that you can reasonably do, I would say that the average person can reasonably do, which is your flashpoint, heroic strikes, the crucible, and let's say you even managed to do a nightfall. The average person is kind of going to stop at that. The average person isn't going to be able to get a raid group or a trials group, let alone, together and complete those activities. So once you've done those milestones for that week, if you're looking to do something to level up, you've got nothing, literally nothing in the game will impact your power level and increase it in any meaningful way. And that is not a good thing. In addition to that, because leveling was slowed down so aggressively, you also have these just nonsensical changes. For example, heroic strikes have gotten a lot harder and that's fine if there's meaningful rewards at the end of the activity. There isn't. Heroic Strikes have a recommended power level of 350 and the rewards only go up to 340. It makes no sense whatsoever. There's no reason to do them beyond doing three for your weekly milestone. So again, slowing leveling was actually a good idea, but the way it was done does create several problems. And if you are someone who doesn't have a clan, is just playing solo, those problems are going to really be evident to you. But moving on from there, let's talk about the new content added within Warmind. This is aside from the campaign. So for strikes, we got three new strikes if you're on the PlayStation. If you're not, you got two new strikes. Now I should actually put new in quotation marks because the two new strikes are just exactly the same as certain campaign missions that have been ripped out and placed in the strike category. Now, a lot of people have criticized this heavily, but I'm gonna say right here, this is a great idea. 
And the reason being is because Bungie has always had a huge problem with incorporating the campaign content into the endgame. This actually makes a ton of sense. In fact, why isn't this done more often? If Bungie is going to do this, why isn't the end mission of the normal campaign where you fight Gaul a strike? That would actually be a really sweet strike and it would make that campaign content relevant in the end game. The problem here is that it doesn't feel like it adds anything. With this, Bungie should have added two strikes that have nothing to do with the campaign, right? Just their own standalone strikes and then also made some of the campaign missions into strikes. That way, you don't feel ripped off. You feel like content is added where otherwise it would have been lost. But because Bungie didn't do that and just repurposed campaign missions, you feel ripped off. Like you feel like you're not gaining any meaningful content. So Bungie, it's a good idea and I hope you stick to it with the next expansion. I want to see these campaign missions repurposed to actually have replayability in the form of strikes. But if you're going to do that and you want to avoid letting their player base know that you're basically ripping them off, you have to do the work and add more additional standalone strikes. Double up on strikes. Repurposing campaign missions shouldn't result in the same strikes we usually get. They should result in, you know, three or four strikes being added instead of two. Now for the strikes themselves, I actually enjoy them. There's some fun engaging boss fights with some interesting mechanics, and they do feel different than other strikes in the game. But moving on from there, another big new piece of content was the brand new area on Mars. This area, it cannot be said enough that this area is so much better than Mercury from Curse of Osiris. Mars, in comparison, feels absolutely happening. Like, it feels like stuff is going on. There's two different sections with Braytech Futurescape and then Glacial Drift, both of which have, I think, one lost sector each. Lost sectors don't matter that much, frankly. But each of these two areas have public events happening. There's three different ones you can get, including the new Warsat public event, where there's a new heroic trigger and everything. That's sweet. We're gonna talk about Escalation Protocol in a bit. But just the overall area of Mars does feel great. And it feels like there's stuff to do. In fact, there's hidden stuff around this map. There's two different things that you can just spend your time getting these hidden items. Firstly, there's these things you can shoot with the proper element. And if you get 35 of them, you can actually go and get an exotic sword. In addition to that, there's these rotating items located all around the map. There's 40 different ones called sleeper nodes. And you actually earn consumables by doing activities in Mars like patrols or public events and so on. And you turn four of these consumables into a clue that helps you go around the map and find the right sleeper node to access and gain loot from. You can even gain Braytech schematics, which allow you to get one of, I think, around four pretty rare weapons and actually pretty decent weapons as well. This is a fantastic time sink. Like just exploring the world, going around Mars, doing sleeper nodes or activating these shootable objects to get the sword or whatever. This should be the standard for how new worlds are done in Destiny 2. It's great for solo players as well. Like if you have no friends on, you just want to chill, go around, listen to music, look for sleeper notes. Like honestly, it's a great time sink. It's a great activity. It helps you explore the world. And it means that your knowledge of exploring the world is actually valuable in helping you track down these hidden items. And those hidden items give you actual good loot. So the new area of Mars, I believe is very well done. I really enjoy it. But also located here is the new activity of Escalation Protocol. People are calling this wave survival, but it really isn't. It doesn't feel anything like, you know, Call of Duty Zombies or any other wave survival mode because you're not trying to survive. You're trying to kill as fast as possible. You have seven different levels. Wave seven or level seven is a special rotating boss fight. Now this is really important and that's gonna mean that every single week is going to be different from the next if you're getting to wave seven. There's five different bosses that can spawn on this wave seven. So every five weeks it is going to start to rotate. But again, that's five different weeks of different 
encounters with different mechanics. That's something that definitely needs to be mentioned. But this escalation protocol activity, the main barrier to doing it is that it has very high level requirements. The base level requirement is a power level of around 370. That's going to take you a while to get to this point. In addition to that, even when you do get to this point, this is not a soloable activity. Now, by all means, you can actually get a random group together, and I would say get even up to wave 3 or potentially higher, because at wave 3, 5, and 7, there are chests that will give you rewards. However, the wave 7 chest will is the only one that will give you powerful gear to actually help with your leveling and the wave 7 boss drops special loot like certain weapons that can only be attained tied to certain bosses and these weapons are actually really cool they're Aikilos weapons that have unique perks and so on but again they're tied to those wave 7 bosses and you are just not going to be able to get all the way to wave 7 with randoms so that means that you need to get nine people the maximum amount of people allowed within an area together in order to do escalation protocol properly now when this works it's really fun like when i was able to get nine people together and we're all talking communicating like you know playstation only allows for an eight person party so one person just has to be out in the world essentially but it's a really fun enjoyable experience where people are communicating there's a lot of teamwork because you have to really time your super usage well so that you can you know use your super get a bunch of orbs which trigger the next supers orbs and you really try to chain these supers together because otherwise if you're just trying to pick away at enemies with normal weapons you really can't you have to have that proper super usage down and it makes for a very fun and engaging experience the waves are always different too because sometimes you'll have a certain wave like let's say level three is going to be a normal wave that just means you kill enemies you have one objective where you have to go and activate this one area and shoot crystals on the higher waves there's going to be three of these areas instead of just one um sometimes waves are going to actually be public events like a public event will spawn but it's a special public event where that activity is going on at the same time like you still have to disarm that warsat or whatever but there's also going to be the escalation protocol bosses that have spawned in and are also trying to prevent you from doing that public event. That's really enjoyable and you won't always get that and what waves those spawn on are random. So again, great for replayability, but that whole nine person thing turns out to be a massive downside for a lot of people because how are you supposed to get nine people on the same map? Well, you actually have to go in to an area and then just start inviting random people and hope that two people join your party and then you convince those two people to have your group that's ready and waiting join off them and even if you're trying to get nine really good players you have to convince them to be replaced like you have to convince the random person to join your party let people join off them kick that random person and have again another person that you have in reserve join off that new fire team it's annoying it's time consuming and it doesn't make any sense like these activities seem to be tailor-made for having a nine person team going at it but firstly bungie really doesn't like to match make after six people like if you have six people in a public area it's really unlikely that a seventh eighth and ninth person are going to join in it's super unlikely in addition to that you can only match make with a fire team of three why is that the case? If you could match make with even, you know, a fire team size of six, it would make escalation protocol so much easier. You could just invite one other random person, get two people to join off them, boom, nine people. But as it is, it's really kind of exclusive to people with large followings or a huge friends list that all plays Destiny or big clans or all of that stuff. If you're someone who isn't really part of a clan and doesn't play Destiny that often and only has, you know, two other friends that play it, you know, good luck. Good luck getting in. You can go to a third party looking for a game website, LFG website, and somehow get in there. But, you know, those are not usually the best, well, most well-oiled teams ready to take down a Wave 7 boss. And the Wave 7 bosses are hard. At Wave 7, the light level of the enemies are is 400. The max light level you can get to is 385, so it is absolutely no joke. So, Escalation Protocol is a very fun, engaging, 
rewarding and changing activity that very few people are going to be able to do properly because of Bungie's extremely restrictive matchmaking. It's really unfortunate. I feel like this almost should have been its own activity that you specifically get a nine person group together for and then go into it somewhat like the Prison of Elders. Because as is now, you know, a lot of players, even if they're of level to do it, the matchmaking is so restrictive that they just won't be able to find a group. Now, moving on, another big piece of content added was the new raid layer, Spire of Stars. This activity is no joke. The recommended light level is 370, but at the end boss fight, the enemies are going to be 380. So you basically have to be near max or maximum power level in order to do this activity properly or have a god tier team and be a god tier player yourself. It really is going to be Frankly, a while before, if you get this expansion tomorrow, you can level up enough and acquire the right gear in order to do this activity. The activity in and of itself, the new raid layer, is a very good activity. All of Bungie's raids are very, very good. Extremely team-focused mechanics, especially this time around, and so therefore it's going to be something that often is very different than other first person shooter experiences. You know, you don't have to communicate as much when you're playing other games. You don't have to be able to learn and master mechanics like you do in the Spire of Stars. So it's a really fun activity if you do get a group together and you can actually complete it. It can get extremely frustrating at times, especially if you're getting a bunch of random people together and, you know, people are dying and blaming each other. Things can fall apart pretty quickly. But if you get a good group together, it's a really, really fun activity. With that being said, even though the content itself is very good, the rewards for doing said content is not so good. When you do the Spire of Stars, you're going to have access to a new set of raid armor, which means absolutely nothing, because aside from how the armor looks, which is cool, it does, it does literally nothing. The armor in Destiny 2 is purely cosmetic. The raid armor has no different perks, no different stats than other armor you probably already have just from getting to the point to be able to do the raid. So that is a huge disappointing area and it basically means that 50% of the loot awarded in Destiny 2 right now is utterly useless aside from cosmetically. Which again, massively disappointing. Bungie needs to address this as soon as possible. Armor needs to have differences. You know, raid armor shouldn't be the exact same as armor you get for loving up in the Crucible for goodness sakes. But aside from that, you're gonna get two new raid weapons which both are decent, but these two weapons are essentially the two missing weapons that belonged to the Leviathan raid loot pool. Gone are the days where we would get entirely new raids with a huge pool of entirely new weapons. You get two, and it's the two that you should have gotten back on Leviathan. So that is also very disappointing. Like, the rewards you get for this activity, especially when you factor in the difficulty of this activity, it just doesn't match. It's nowhere near matching. So, you know, that's something to absolutely consider. The activity itself, very fun. The actual tangible rewards, not there at all. So that's really it for PvE content. But supplementing all of this is a couple of new exotic quests. Um, one that seems to be time-gated around five weeks of doing certain activities. Um, other ones like the Super Simulant, you get for a world quest after you've beaten the campaign. That's kind of often its own thing. You also have another exotic quest uh, to get the Wordline Zero exotic sword, as I mentioned, for shooting these certain things located and hidden all around the map, which is a really cool idea. So there's things to be doing, there's things to be earning that are different of the content specifically that is stated to be added with this expansion. So all of that makes for a pretty decent package because frankly in terms of pve there seems to be always something to do that's what i found with this expansion there's always something to do next there's always something to grind for there's always something to complete you know and that's a very good thing we're going to talk about the overall package in a sec because now we have to move on to pvp now admittedly pvp is not necessarily my strong suit i definitely enjoy the pve portion more in terms of destiny 2 than i do the pvp portion but i've played a decent amount of pvp since this expansion came out and i've played with some of the really hardcore pvp players that like stream trials carries non-stop and so on and i've been listening to their perspectives and so on essentially pvp you know nothing 
changed in terms of the actual inner workings of PvP. Like, is time to kill faster than before? Not really. Possibly a little bit due to buffs of exotic weapons that every player got and was an overall good change, but again, time to kill is not drastically different. Did the weapon system change? No. Are abilities being tuned? Not really. Like, they're a little bit faster due to a previous patch, the Go Faster update, but this expansion didn't really add more to that. Is there new subclasses or classes to play around with? Not at all. So, PvP, there's a new meta. That's what the main change is with Warmind. There's a new meta. There's some new top dog weapons. You know, most people are running around with a Graviton Lance and an Antiope SMG, or they're running around with the Vigilance Wing and a Last Hope, right? I know there's more options now, and frankly, there's actually a pretty decent amount of Tier 2 options out there for things that you can use and still be competitive, but it's basically just a new meta. Those are the top dogs. That's what you're going to see 90% of the time, people using those weapons, and it certainly hasn't drastically altered it. So if you're trying to get a more Destiny 1 feeling PvP, if you're trying to get a different experience, you're not really going to get this with this expansion. In addition to that, Bungie did introduce the ranked PvP system, and they actually made PvP maps from both the expansions available to everyone. Great changes, and they introduced private matches. Great changes. These are all things to do, and grinding those PvP ranks will give you new weapons available to get. Uh, the pulse rifle that you attain for getting a pretty high ranking in the competitive rank, Glory, is really, really good. It's actually a very competitive weapon, so people are actually going to be trying to go for that and earn that and so on. But, but, for the average player, for the just the normal person who's going to buy this expansion, I can't see PvP being... A genuinely rewarding experience and that's because there's no solo queue so that means that it's just non-stop stacked groups constantly trying to farm rank and they are just going to give you no quarter and it's going to be a very unfun experience for your average player and, and that's just a fact right if you try to hop in and grind a competitive playlist even if you're a really good player your teammates are probably not also going to be really good players and you are almost always going to match a completely stacked team. People are basically at the point already where they're just completely avoiding, especially the competitive playlist, unless they have a full team. And that's just the nature of Destiny 2 PvP right now. Because you have a slower time to kill in general, you can't really have those hero moments like you can in Call of Duty where you take down the entire team. Very hard to do that unless you're using a super in Destiny 2. Also, there's no map, there's no radar, I should say, in competitive anymore. So, the teams that are together, the four-player teams, they're going to be communicating where people are, whereas you, if you're just randomly solo matchmaking, are not, unless you join the team chat and all of your teammates join the team chat, which is a rare occurrence. And I know it sounds like I'm being very negative about PvP, and there's certainly some negative aspects, but the fact of the matter is that PvP is better than it was before this expansion. The introduction of ranks was more of a positive than a negative. People actually have something to do now, something to grind for. Also, a bunch of new maps for all players is fantastic. And a new meta is frankly a welcome thing. Even though, you know, we're probably going to get sick of the Graviton and the Vigilance Swing pretty soon here. And hopefully Bungie can, you know, buff some other guns or something like that soon. It's still better than it was before and change is more welcome than it is not welcome. But I'm just saying for the average player that, you know, doesn't have a big clan of people ready to go for PvP who just buys this expansion to see what it's like, you're going to have probably a pretty rough time, to be perfectly honest. Now, Trials of the Nine does have some new weapons available as rewards for Season 3, but kind of the same problems apply. If you can get a team together and you can go flawless or close to flawless or even just get seven wins, it's a legitimately fun experience. But, it, you know, you well, you can't even match make solo. You have to get a team together and doing so is likely going to be a huge barrier for a lot of people. So that's where we come kind of to the end of this review. How is Warmind really as an addition to Destiny 2? Well, frankly, Warmind, the best I can describe it is that it is a huge band-aid for destiny 2 
This expansion does not inherently fix any of the underlying issues within Destiny 2. It doesn't make armor relevant. It doesn't fix the loot system. It doesn't really address endgame problems that much, otherwise just extending your journey to the endgame with slower leveling. But it does cover the wound. That's the thing. And that, for a lot of players, is going to be good enough. If you are someone who left Destiny 2 just because you didn't have anything to do anymore. There's not necessarily a bunch of ill will. You just thought, you know what, I'm bored of the game. I'm going to go play Fortnite with all my other friends or whatever. I'm going to go do something else. And you were just really waiting for more content to be added to Destiny 2 to give you an excuse to come back. You're going to love this expansion because this expansion provides exactly that. More content and that content does last a while. I'm still playing this game a lot and I still have stuff to do, which is fantastic. So for the not disgruntled Destiny player, it's exactly what the doctor ordered. Now these inherent problems I mentioned earlier, the loot system, the weapon system, you know, the armor, all of that stuff does need to be fixed. It absolutely needs to be fixed. But hopefully Warmind will give us a big enough band-aid to last all the way to September where these issues are truly being addressed. That is the good. The bad is that if you're someone who did leave Destiny 2 with a bad taste in your mouth, if you're someone who doesn't like Destiny 2, who was mad at the direction the game goes, this expansion does not alter that direction. It does not fix anything again inherently. You are probably not going to enjoy this expansion. This expansion is not for you because you're going to come back and you're going to find pretty much the same problems that you found before, you know, just slower progression and a little bit more things to do. But another problem is that this expansion is great for the people who were already playing Destiny 2. It's great for me. It's great for all the people on my friends list who kept playing Destiny 2 because we all have a tight-knit clan together and we play with each other all the time so we can get groups for Escalation Protocol and raids and so on. But for the players who aren't in that position, the players returning, they are going to have a very hard time getting leveled up and ready without having that dedicated group of clanmates or of friends that are constantly playing this game. You are going to have a legitimately hard time. Now, if you're okay with it taking a few months to get leveled up and in just slowly grinding the game and doing your milestones every week and then hopping back off, like some people may enjoy that. And then therefore, this is perfect for you. But I do feel like the solo player does suffer in this expansion. So, we are going to end this review with the question, should you buy the Warmind expansion? And again, that answer really depends on the state you left Destiny 2, if you left at all. If you're still playing the game, and you just don't know whether or not you want to spend $20, I would say 100% it's worth it. Because it's just going to add more to your experience. You're already playing the game, this is going to improve the amount of things you have to do. If you're someone who left, again, and you left mad, maybe skip this one because nothing has fundamentally changed. If you left and you're not necessarily harboring any ill will, you're looking for an excuse to return, this is your excuse. This is a much better expansion than the Curse of Osiris, and this is going to give you a lot of new activities to do and, and ways to grind and things to explore. It's going to be overall positive experience. I should also very much mention that even if you want to test the waters before purchasing, this is a great time. A lot of the things added with Warmind didn't specifically get added for this expansion. For example, I mentioned that exotics got buffed, exotic weapons got massive buffs. This is available to all players. The PvP maps from this expansion and Curse of Osiris were added for all players. A lot of changes occurred for all players. So it's a great time to load up Destiny 2 again, experience it again, and decide if this new meta, if these new exotics, if this new version of the game is something you want to add on to with Warmind. And so guys, that is it for the video. I hope you enjoyed and found this informative. If you did, 
please remember to help me out by simply rating and especially sharing this video. If you guys want to see more Destiny 2 content similar to this, don't be afraid to slap that subscribe button. And if you guys want to get in touch with me and keep up to date with the latest channel activity, the best way is to follow me on Twitter at RickCacus. That's linked in the description down below, as is my Twitch channel, which you can also follow. Again, I hope you enjoyed the video, and as always, have a good day.